My name is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC ECHO. Welcome to this week's session, and I will turn it over to today's speaker. Um, I'm really excited to, to be here today remote. Brian is also not telling you is that he and I trained in the same uh, HIV program a billion years ago. So we've sort of orbited the same circles for many years. So um, I'm very excited to be with you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about very briefly the, the state of the art of pre-exposure prophylaxis then, just trying to give a, a quick overview of agents that are in the pipeline and their um, their, their advantages and disadvantages um, in about 15, 20 minutes. I'm happy to answer questions after that. I do think it's important uh, that everyone know that I do consult for Gilead and, and they've donated some drug to some of my demonstration projects. So I think that's important. I know Joanne Steckler, who's in the room in, in Seattle, um, has talked to you guys about the, the efficacy data um, from clinical trials on TDF, FTC-based pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I'm going to just very briefly um, revisit this here as a, as a context text for moving forward. Joanne's probably told you all and you all know from your own experience that the first um, clinical trial to demonstrate efficacy of pre-exposure prophylaxis for TDF-FTC was the IPREC study published in 2010 and, and that enrolled 2,400 MSM and trans women and, and showed a 42% ultimately in the final analysis risk reduction for the MSM and trans women who received active TDF-FTC um, as opposed to um, a matching placebo. And of course, there was a lot of excitement about a positive statistically significant result, but a lot of concern that the point estimate was was so low. And I think I know I was disappointed when I heard those initial results because we know that condoms for protection against rectal acquisition of HIV can be in the 70 plus percent protection range. And so a 42 percent point estimate, I think, was disappointing to a lot of people. And of course, as we're going to get to, the devil is in the details. But that point estimate, I think, surprised people in a little bit of a disappointing way. Um, let me continue on. And I just want to parenthetically say that the the construct that I'm using in this slide is is the church or synagogue um, bazaar at um, Christmas time. So, you know, they put a thermometer outside and do fundraising um, and they fill it up as 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 funding is 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 generated. And and the idea here is I'm going to fill up each of the individuals on this on this slide um, to show their efficacy because I kind of hate tables and start to fall asleep when people put up tables of, of efficacy estimates. I hope that's okay. The next study that, that got presented was, was the FEMPREP study, which was an IPREXIAN, if that's a word, study of HIV uninfected women, uh, cisgender women in sub-Saharan Africa, and it looked at TDF, FTC versus a placebo. And you all know the punchline that that study was stopped early for a complete absence of effect. And so the initial reaction at this point was, goodness, does this work for rectal exposures but not for vaginal exposures? The next study to be presented was the TDF2 study, which looked at TDF-FTC in uh, heterosexual men and women in Botswana and showed a statistically significant reduction for the active product in, in men and a 49% reduction in, in women, but it was not statistically significant. So this generated a tremendous amount of excitement um, because it suggested that an effect for vaginal exposures was possible. And of course, you know, uh, you know, you all in Seattle know better than anyone that the landmark and behemoth effort on on the part of Connie Kellum and Jared Beaton in Kenya and Uganda showed for the first time statistically significant protection for both heterosexual men and women, this time in serodiscordant partnerships in Kenya and Uganda for both TDF, FTC, and for TDF alone. So really a lot of excitement. And of course, you know, the study that was supposed to confirm this effect for women the voice study done by Jeannie Marazzo while she was still at UW, of course, was completely negative and confused the field tremendously, particularly because the point estimates on these studies suggested a trend towards harm, right? These were um, the people who got active drug compared to placebo for the oral dosing arms um, actually had more HIV infection um, than the people who got placebo. And, and so not surprisingly, both consumers and providers of PrEP were confused by this. And the last study I'm going to mention in this efficacy sort of summary for daily prep um, is, is the PROUD study, which was slightly different and because it was in the UK and it wasn't placebo controlled. It was an immediate versus deferred strategy of TDF, FTC, and MSM in the UK that, of course, showed 86% protection of the people who got immediate PrEP compared to the people who were on delayed schedule. 
And of course, you all know the punchline to all of this, which is it doesn't work if you don't take it, right? So the difference in this where biomarkers of adherence suggest that the protective efficacy across all of these studies was really intimately related to adherence and probably a large portion of the difference in the effect um, for rectal exposures as opposed to vaginal exposures is attributable to a need for more fidelity to adherence to get vaginal protection than you need for rectal protection. Now, you might say, okay, I know all that. Joanne's taught me all that. I've done my own reading. That's great. Tell me something I don't know. I think this the stage that this sets up is, you know, of course, um, you have to be relatively religious in taking TDF, FTC for it to work. And I say relatively, of course, because if we have time at the end, we can talk about on-demand dosing for rectal exposures and, and what that implies to PrEP use. But it really sets the stage for us to do better, for, for looking at age that might be safer, that don't have bone, GI, or renal toxicity, and might not require such rigorous adherence to daily dosing, which is particularly important in getting it as a protection option for people who are more marginalized, less engaged in healthcare systems, have more medical mistrust, face all sorts of structural, social, economic barriers to taking a tablet every day. And that's what I'm going to focus the rest of, of my talk on today. The first study I want to talk about about is actually one that was done um, in Seattle also. It was a multi-site study that was trying to ask the question of could Maraviroc, which is a CCR5 receptor antagonist that is FDA approved as part of HIV treatment but very infrequently used for a variety of reasons, be a good PrEP agent. And, you know, from a mechanistic standpoint, it's kind of attractive to think that a CCR5 antagonist could be a PrEP agent, right? Because you want to prevent HIV from entering the cell prior to it establishing infection, and that's what CCR5 antagonists do. I would remind everyone, of course, that that CCR5 receptor antagonists actually do not act on the virus itself, as opposed to all the other antivirals that we have and use frequently. Um, this acts against a cellular protein. So there are background residual concerns that it may um, have implications on immune function as well as being an anti-HIV agent. But from a mechanistic standpoint, it was very exciting. And, and Trip Gulick from Cornell in New York actually spearheaded um, this study, which was co-sponsored by both the ACTG and the HPTN. And, and it had a little bit of a complicated design. It had 600 people really parsed into two cohorts. There was an MSM and trans women cohort with 400 people and um, a separate cohort of 200 cisgender women. And there were four arms. And I'm going to ask you as you look at these four arms to just look at the the agents in bold, and I'm asking you to look over on the right first at arm four, because arm four is really the control arm, and it's the components of TDF FTC. They're given as individual pills, so everyone in this study was given three tablets or capsules to take every day. Some of them were active, some of them were placebos. So this is really not a real-world prep experiment, and it was designed for safety. It was not powered for efficacy. We'll come back to that point in a second. So the ARM4 was really the control arm, the components of TDF and FTC, the Maraviroc was a placebo. And if you look at the bolded agents in each of the other three arms, you'll see Maraviroc alone and in every permutation with the components of TDF FTC. So arm one is Maraviroc alone, the others were placebo, arm two, Maraviroc with FTC, and arm three, Maraviroc with TDF. And the idea being, you know, there might be an opportunity to zero convert with CXCR4 using virus, so maybe Maraviroc by itself is not sufficient for PrEP. And, and I think everyone was expecting Maraviroc to be better tolerated and, and not to see a different in, difference in the number of HIV infections. And, um, let me first tell you about the MSM and trans women cohort, because there were, there were no differences in safety or tolerability between the arms, which I think was surprising because I think we would have expected less renal side effects, perhaps less GI side effects. There was a bone mineral density substudy that was, um, presented at last year that we're still waiting to see the final manuscript on looking at bone differences between these regimens. But there were five new HIV infections, and I can't reiterate this strongly enough. This study was not powered for efficacy, but all five of the HIV infections were in Maraviroc-containing arms. And for me, although it was not powered for efficacy, 
that gave me a little bit of pause. And if you combine that with, um, it's only been in presentation form at this point, but Ian McGowan led a, a rectal tissue sub-study of this study where they took rectal biopsies from participants in each of the four arms and in a Petri dish tried to ex vivo challenge these biopsy specimens with laboratory strains of virus. And what they found was the Maraviroc containing biopsy specimens were easier to infect than the TDF, FTC, or combination biopsy specimens. That in combination with this, again, not statistically powered for efficacy observation, has really hung up the further development of Maraviroc, and I'm not sure we're going to see fully powered phase three studies with this agent. I'm not going to tell you anything more about the cis women subset because there also were not any difference in safety and tolerability, but there weren't any HIV infections in any arm in that study, but there also were very few STDs in the, the women's study. So it's not really clear that it was done in really at-risk women. So not clear what we can say about it. The one thing I do want to point out, if you look carefully at the table that's up on your screen, is coming back to this notion that was true about TDF-FTC of if you don't take it, it doesn't work, right? And if you look at the Maraviroc concentrations in that final right-hand column, there you can see that really only one of the participants who Ciro converted had detectable Maraviroc of any, um, any significant level in their system at the time the Ciro conversion was discovered. So again, do we interpret this as the Maraviroc didn't work or as they didn't take it so people became infected? And again, we may not see a phase three study to fully answer that question. Let me move on to TAF because there's a lot of excitement about TAF for PrEP because of its improved safety profile in HIV infected individuals. You all know TAF is a different ester of tenofovir that's now FDA approved as part of HIV treatment in combination with other agents. And the reason for its improved safety profile is presumed to be the fact that it has about 90% lower free tenofovir levels in plasma and about 90% higher tenofovir levels in PBMCs and other white blood cells, which allows it to retain activity without bathing target organs such as the kidney or bone in the more toxic or presumed to be toxic active free tenofovir metabolite. But, you know, that may be great for treatment, but the question is, what's the relevant concentration or location to have concentration target tissue for PrEP? We don't really know the answer to that question, do we? Is it plasma levels? Is it intracellular levels of white blood cells? Is it tissue levels? And without a clear answer to that question, it is possible that TAF may not work for prevention, even though it works great for treatment. Some data that gives a lot of people pause um, is uh, that human females were given single doses of TAF and um, it did not concentrate well either in rectal or vaginal tissues of these women. So TDF allowed its metabolites to concentrate much better in these genital tissues than TAF did. So this suggests that if genital tissue levels are in fact what's required for PrEP activity, this may not work. Remember, it also has 90% lower plasma levels. So if plasma levels are what's required, it may not work for PrEP. However, in a macaque study where these macaques were challenged with shiv after exposure to TAF FTC, it was highly protective. So some people think that it does have a good chance, even absent concentration in these genital tissues and maintenance of plasma levels because it has the same properties in these non-human primates. There is a fully powered head-to-head -head comparison study of TDF FTC and TAF FTC ongoing. It is fully enrolled right now, and it hopefully will answer this question. But until we have the results of this Discover trial, which is a Gilead-sponsored trial, I don't feel comfortable using it for pre-exposure prophylaxis. I'm not sure if any of your sites there are participating in Discover, but it is fully enrolled.
Let me move on to some of the long-acting injectables that are in development, because, and I'm biased about this because I'm involved in the development of long-acting cabotegravir, but I think they're really exciting. And the idea would be someone would receive an injection of a long-acting medication um, in a muscle that then serves as a depot of that agent, and then it slowly seeps out of the muscle over time into the bloodstream, providing sustained levels. Not unlike Depo Provera, not unlike Depo forms of antipsychotic agents like paliperidone. So there's precedent for this sort of thing, and giving people more choices is probably better. But what agents are in development? And the first is Rilpivirine, which of course you all know to be FDA approved as part of HIV treatment alone, and I'm sorry, in combination with other um, HIV agents. Long-acting Rilpivirine is available as a nano suspension, which which basically means a crystalline pure form of the drug is ground up into nanoparticles that are 200 nanometers in size and then suspended in a polyethylene glycol solution, which is injected into the gluteal muscle. And the problem is, of course, is that it lasts a long time in the body. It's good because it lasts a long time in the body. It's bad because it lasts a long time in the body. So if there's an adverse event, you can't remove it once administered. So all of the trials of these long-acting injectables are designed in the same way. Because each of these drugs has a short-acting tablet formulation, you always start by administering the short-acting tablet formulation for about a month to establish safety with the short-acting version so you could remove it, stop administering, and it would wash out of the system um, if there's a side effect. And then, and then you administer the long-acting injectable version, and then you follow people as the long-acting preparation washes out of the system its so-called pharmacokinetic tail. So they did this with Rilpivirine in 136 HIV uninfected women, ages 18 to 45, who were low risk for HIV acquisition. And here's the punchline of it. It was safe and well tolerated. The women liked it. Um, but the problem is this injectable form of Rilpivirine requires a cold chain, which for global use is not really attractive. And for reasons that are a little unclear to me, the, the maker of Rilpivirine doesn't really seem interested in pursuing the approval of this drug for PrEP. Um, they're pursuing it as part of treatment with long-acting cabotegravir, but not for PrEP. Um, one of the reasons I can sort of surmise that they may be less interested is, of course, if you get resistant to Rilpivirine, if you break through Rilpivirine as a PrEP agent, it has the potential to compromise the efficacy of a Favarin's or other non-nucleoside-based first-line therapy, which is still used globally as first-line in many locations, although there is a, an increase movement towards dolutegravir as first line, so this might not be as much of an issue in the future. And in fact, there's been one case already, it's fascinating, of a low-risk woman who received about a, a quarter of the dose that was used in these phase three trials, sorry, phase two trials, these are phase two, um, of long-acting rilpivirine, um, and had an exposure 40 days after they got the injection, and seroconverted with non-nucleoside resistant virus. So um, that fear has actually been seen with this real pivoting long-acting preparation. And again, so it's unclear if it's going to move forward into phase three clinical trials at this time. So stay tuned for more about that. And then the last agent I'm going to tell you about, and again, I'm biased because I'm involved in this, is cabotegravir, right, which is, you know, sort of the fifth integrase inhibitor that we've been hearing about, right? There's raltegravir, elvitegravir, dolutegravir, soon probably to be Bictegravir and, and then Cabotegravir. And, and, and that drug went through some phase two studies just like Rilpivirine did in a study called HPTN 077 that showed good safety and tolerability. And this did move into phase three studies. And the phase three study in MSM and trans women is called HPTN 083. It's in the field now. It's uh, enrolling 4,500 gay men and trans women all over the world. And it's comparing cabotegravir as a gluteal injection to daily oral TDF FTC as PrEP and HIV incidence as the primary outcome. I just want to show you what cabotegravir looks like. It's a three milliliter injection. I don't know if that makes people excited or scared. Um, you, you know, so it's, you know, a, a large injection, but not, uh, you know, uh, intolerable. 
It's sort of milky and not per particularly viscous. You can use a very small gauge needle to inject it. It does have to be injected in the gluteal muscle at this point. There's no guidance for recommendation of injection in a thigh muscle, but it does have to be a large muscle. So you couldn't use a deltoid or an abdominal muscle for administration. It's a double blind, double dummy study, which means we had to come up with a fake for cabotegravir injection. So we're using intralipid which is, of course, a feeding solution for people requiring TPN. And you can see here what the intralipid 20% solution looks like compared to the cabotegravir. And people are either getting active cabotegravir and placebo Truvada, or the intralipid solution is a placebo for cabotegravir and active Truvada. And it's a head-to-head -head comparison in that way. We're hoping to have results by 2021. So stay tuned for more about that. And it's designed to be a registrational trial that would hopefully lead to regulatory approvals. There is a sister study called HPTN-084 that's being done in cisgender women in sub-Saharan Africa that launched on World AIDS Day of 2016. I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions, and thank you all very much for your attention.